So first thing that I would like to do is look at Scala from the perspective of some other languages to encourage you to learn Scala and to make you aware of what Scala offers you and you take for granted. In the second part, I will talk about big data analysis use case that we do every day uh, at our company using Apache Spark and Scala. So now, how to compare Scala with other languages? Let's choose a task, implement it in different languages and see what we find out. So this has to be a data processing task, so this is what we'll have. Input will be a set of players that play the game and will have their name and list of their answers. The answers can be true or false, and we have to find the winners. These are the names of the players that answered most of the time correctly. Okay, so this will be the running example. So with which languages should we compare Java? Does anybody remember this? Yes, yeah, some of the people are smiling, okay. So maybe you're looking at me like I'm weird because I want to talk about QBasic in Scala conference. Well, why I'm doing this, part of it is because it's fun and part of it is because if you want to see the whole picture, you have to stand, step, take a step back. For instance, I don't see this picture very well. You are further back and you see it better. So if we want to see Scala very good, we have to take a big step back and looking at it from the perspective of QBasic is way back. So this is as far back as I can go. I learned to program in QBasic some 25 years ago when I was a kid and I loved it. I loved it because I could draw pictures and animations with it even before we had Windows and Paintbrush. I could uh, make a program that would play a song with computer beeper even before we had sound cards and so on. But I'm not going to torture you with my artistic stuff but I do will torture you with some of my code. This is where I got it from. I had some trouble finding a computer that would accept this floppy disk. So this is some of the code that I would like to show you. What will be the input data structure? We'll have two tables, one for player names, this will be strings, and one two-dimensional for this course, whether the answers were true or false. To make it simpler, these tables will have constant size, and we'll have to fake the Boolean type, which is non-existent in QBasic. And then the output will again be a table, but it may have fewer entries than the input, so we'll kind of have to implement array lists, so we'll have to remember what's the last index of the player that we put into this table of winners. So what my program from 25 years ago looks like, Basically, it starts a loop that goes for all the players, and then it immediately does this. It uses a go-to statement. Uh, I guess many of you never used go-to statement, but uh, go-to's are the best recipe for making spaghetti code. So, although it sounds delicious, avoid it. This is the, the best way for making bugs. So what does this do? It jumps to this kind of subroutine down below, and it calculates balance. So if the answer is true, it decreases it for one. If the answer is false, it decreases it. So if the balance is positive, we have a winner. Uh, the next bad thing that we see in this program are those global variables. Uh, here we defined current as the index that goes for all the players, and we use it down in this subroutine. And this sets the balance, and the balance is then used up. So another good opportunity for making bugs. The third opportunity for making bugs is this equal sign. Once it is used as a comparison, and once it is used as an assignment. Uh, the third opportunity for making bugs is this uh, array list that we kind of implement on our own. We may forget to increase the index, and the results will be wrong. So QBasic doesn't look very good. We can't model the data very well. But I still think it's good because I learned to program in it, in it and I still and programming after 20, 25 years. So the next language I would look, like to look at is Pascal. And this was the next language I had to learn. And uh, interesting fact, it was developed by Nicholas Wirt, who was the mentor of Odersky, who is the author of Scala. So comparing Pascal and Scala is like comparing the same line of thought just 20 years after. So what Pascal offers, uh, it forces you to explicitly define types which I hated back then. Uh, it allows you to define your user types. It takes away go-to statements, which I also hated, and it introduces pointers, which was a nightmare back then, but 
Now I learned to appreciate Pascal. Let's see why. The first thing we can do, we can represent this input data as records. So we have grouped together the name and the uh, array of booleans. Uh, the second thing that we can do, the winners, will be a linked list. So we can use pointers, uh, and this linked list will be composed of elements that have name and the pointer to the next name in the list. And this list is then composed of two pointers, pointer to the first element in the list and the last one. So what does the program look like? It's very similar as before. We initialize this list of winners, then we have for loop that goes for all the results. But now we have the first important difference. We don't have this ugly go-to statement. We have a function call. I'll explain in a minute why this is good. Then when we finish, we have to output everything. And uh, because we didn't use a library for these lists, we have to manage pointers ourselves. So get the first element in the winner's list and then iterate through it to output it. Now why calling this one function is much better than just jumping to some code? because the compiler can check that the data that we pass to the function is correct, or at least has the correct type, and that what we get back has the correct type. The second good thing is that we have local variables, so the code outside of this function can't uh, break these variables, and code inside this can break variables outside of this. Uh, and this is why Pascal is better. Now, some, something more serious. Uh, I'll talk about Java. It has object-oriented programming, which again was a bit hard to learn, a new concept. And just as I began to understand pointers, Java just took them away. But it gave us a garbage collection in return. So how to implement this program in Java? It's pretty much the same. Input data will be the same. We'll have name and this list of booleans. But now it's not a record, it's a class. This is why we have to define this constructor method that initializes this data. And why this is better? Because in Pascal we could have forgotten to set the name or to set the scores. Here the, uh, this constructor will remind us that we have to set both, both data. In this case it looks simple, but if you have complex uh, data structures with many fields, constructors come in handy. The second good thing is this getter method. Why we need it? Because we can hide this name and this uh, array of booleans. And code outside of this class won't see it, so nobody will be able to make bugs regarding to it, but we'll have to write this getter method. Uh, even better thing is that now this one method is grouped together in a class. It's not hanging around somewhere. It's grouped together in a class. So in your uh, beloved IDE, you can type uh, the name of a variable, say dot, and then use autocomplete, which will list all the functions that you can call on this data specifically. Um, but the best, ah, okay, we have some better syntax. This is not very important. The best thing is that now we can define interface. We can say, I don't really care how this data is implemented. All I care is that it can give me the name and it can tell me if the player won. This is all we need. And this is all we will use in code outside of this class. So let's see how this works. Uh, we'll have this list of results that offer this interface. We'll return a list of strings, which are the winners. And now we again have a loop. Notice that now we don't have any index that goes for the loop. And inside the loop, we use these functions offered by interface. Now why this is good? For instance, let's, change, let's say that our uh, demands change, our specification change, and now each player can have, play multiple rounds. And if he won in one round, then we want to say that he's the winner. How would we implement that in Pascal? Well, we would have to change code all over the place. In Java, which forces us to object-oriented programming, all we have to do is implement a new class that again offers the same interface, and we only change the data structure a bit in this win one function. So why this is good? I believe that it was good when I was studying it, but I never really felt it until I got my first job uh, thanks to the object-oriented programming. So uh, let's see why. Because you can only change, uh, loc make local changes and leave the rest of the code as it was. 
Let's see this example. I was working at a research institute as a student, and we were investigating heuristic search. These are the algorithms that return you the, the fastest way on Google Maps, or the algorithm that uh, wins uh, against you in chess. Uh, I was working on that on a bit simpler game. This is a tall problem, where you have to arrange these uh, numbers uh, by just uh, moving th this empty tile left and right. So we can ha have these two moves and so on. And uh, we were investigating how this heuristic search works. And I spent like three months on it and then wrote uh, my report. My supervisor was happy. But then he said, Rock, look, you see, this game has only four moves. And you made this nice analysis. Now, what if I add additional moves? Make the same analysis again. And he kind of expected that it would take me a lot of time. Well, thankfully, I was working in Java with object-oriented programming. So all of my code that I developed for three months used just those two functions. Get all the moves in a position and get the new position. And all I had to do is change this. And uh, by the end of the day, I had done an analysis for this new game. And this is partially why I got the job at this institute later. Now, finally, to Scala. Scala is still object-oriented. It's good because it runs on JVM, so it can use all your Java libraries. But it's functional. And what functional means to me, it means that you don't have variables. They're immutable. Once you set their values, you can change it. And uh, what is also good from my point of view when I'm working with data is that it offers nice APIs to work with collections, such as lists and so on. So in Scala, we implement the same thing again. Interface is now called a trait. We still have class with this data. The only difference is that we can use case class. So this will generate constructor and getter methods for us. So less writing, but so far, nothing special. The special thing is that now we don't have a for loop. Now we use this score data, and we say apply a function that will count the elements in this table, the ones uh, I applied entities. So this will map true to true, false to false. So it will effectively count the number of trues. Uh, so the whole problem, problem looks similar as before. We have same input output, and again, we got rid of this function. We get all the results and filter out just the ones uh, for which uh, this object say that are winners. And then we map it into names. So we forget about the scores. We get just the names back. And why this is good? Well, let's say now our requirements again change. And now we don't have a game with 20 players. We have a game with millions and billions of players. So this list of players is enormous. We can fit it into a single machine. So we need to make it parallel. How to do that? Well, in theory, it looks easy. We have this humongous table. We split it into parts of the tables and send each part to one machine. And ask each of these machines to get us the list of winners. And then we all have to, that have to do is collect the results back. In theory, it looks pretty simple. But in reality, there are difficult problems that we have to solve how to parallelize this algorithm that was written for a single machine, how to distribute all this data, how to coordinate the data between these different processes, and what happens if one of these processes fails? Well, luckily, we don't have to think about these things because we have Spark. This is what Spark does for you. It enables uh, cluster computing, uh, and this implicit parallelism means that you as programmer pretend that you're working with a single machine, and Spark, behind the scene, will distribute this processing to multiple machines. It has fault tolerance. It means that if one of these servers where we run this big data processing fails, we won't know about it. Spark will take care of this. Uh, it offers APIs in Java, Python, Scala, and R. But I think uh, Scala is the best because uh, Spark offers this functional programming model. And one thing that you have to know about is this resilient distributed data sets. This is the low level in, in Spark. This is the data structures that we work with. So data set means that it's the data structure. Distributed means that it lives on multiple computers, but you as programmers see it as one chunk of the data. And resilient means if one of these computers dies, you don't know about it, everything still works. So now how to change our Scala program in order to make it parallel? 
Well, pretty simple. All we have to do is when we get our input data, we call method parallelize. This will distribute it. And then when we get the results back, we do collect. Notice that now this winners is not a list of strings. It's this RDD, resilient distributed data set of strings. And uh, at the beginning, we have to initialize this Spark context, but uh, this is not very difficult. So what we got for free is how to parallelize our programs. We pretend that we program for one machine, but it works on multiple machines in parallel. So going through this, I think I see a pattern. Maybe I don't have enough data and this pattern is wrong, but it seems to me that more, there is more restricted we as programmers are, less chances we have to make bugs and the easier it becomes for us to maintain a code base, to add new features, to fix bugs. Why I think this is so? Because if the language is restricted, then compiler can do more for us. Uh, in summary, what is this that, why Scala is good, what it offers us? A compiler that finds a lot of bugs, uh, then it forces us or allows us to better model the data, to use optimal data structures, it has object-oriented programming, which forces us to a better design. It hides implementation details. It makes easy for uh, maintenance. And functional programming, for me, means that I get free parallelization. So this is why I like Scala. So in summary, which language to choose? Choose the one that fits your tools the best. So if you're working with nails, use a hammer. If you're, using, if you're working with screws, then you use a screwdriver instead. And once you've chosen your tool, your language, learn about it and try to use all of its advantages. Now, some people say that learning Scala is difficult, but to me, the learning QBasic was difficult also. Learning pointers in Pascal was also difficult. Learning about object-oriented programming was also difficult. So learning Scala was nothing, nothing special. And now that I at least know how to program in Scala, I can do better things faster. So now to the second part of the presentation, this use case with big data. I'll introduce what we do at our company so you'll have some background. So Celtra is into mobile advertising. Uh, we started in Ljubljana some 10 years ago. Now we have engineering also in San Francisco, New York, and some other offices. Uh, across the globe. And this is the list of brands that worked with us. You may recognize a lot of them. Uh, and why they want to work with us? Because we offer three things. Uh, I'll explain it like I'm explaining to engineers, not like uh, our sales would explain to our customers. So the first thing we offer is this web tool where uh, designers can make beautiful ads simply by dragging and dropping. No coding needed. And it's very rich. We have like 300 components you can use. Pictures, animations, uh, text, hotspots, videos, store locators, and so on. I'll show example in a minute. The second thing we do, we serve those ads. And we make sure that the ads work and look good on different sizes of screen, on different devices, on so mobile phones, tablets, smart TVs, personal computers, and in different environments, in Android apps, in iOS apps, in web browsers, and so on. The first thing that I will be talking about in this part of the presentation is we offer our clients some feedback by which they can optimize their campaign. Uh, and this is basically analytics. And because we have a lot of data, we need to use Spark to, to process this data. So what our ads looks like, for example, this is an ad. There are a couple of pictures. When you click on hotspot, you see some animations. At the bottom, you have some buttons. And if you press a button, you get to the next screen of this ad, where you have, again, some animations and some swipeable content. And then if you press uh, another button, you get to the third screen that, for example, has this store locator, where you have map, and uh, it shows you where you can buy this product that is advertised. And all of this can be made uh, by a designer just by dragging and dropping, and it will work on iPhone, it will work on your smart TV, anywhere. So this is what we do. Uh, now I'll switch to the 
other part of the presentation, so big data analytics. What we offer as analytics department, our analytics comes in three forms. The most important things are shown on the dashboard. So the top, these circles that you see, uh, we show the number of served ads, we show the number of ads that were actually shown, the number of ads where video was played for two seconds, the number of ads where the entire video was played. And these are basically what we call those numbers are metrics. So this is the first term that you'll have to report, remember, metrics. Then we can break down these metrics, for instance, by date. This is the second bar when you see how this changes for time. Instead of uh, date, the dimension could be the device type or the environment, browser version, something like that. Uh, if this is enough, if this is not enough for our clients, they can use Support Builder where they just collect or select the set of metrics and dimensions they want to see and they can export this report. And for the most advanced clients, we offer this API where they can say the same, but they can do this programmatically. So this is uh, a high level overview of this analytics pipeline. We get events from ads and ads are not just static pictures, these are actually JavaScript programs that are aware of themselves and know what's happening with them and then send data back to us. We collect this data, we partition it uh, and we store it. We must not lo lose this data because we get paid by the number of served impression and if we don't have a log that a net was served, then we don't get paid. So this is quite simple process, but it must always work. And this is where our analytics start. This is the data that we start with. Then we compute uh, what we call sessions. And session is uh, like a lifetime of an ad. Everything that happens with an ad in its lifetime is then collected into this session model. And we store this into a special database. From this, we compute these aggregated dimensions and metrics. We have like 200 metrics, metrics and 150 dimensions, which are stored in some 30 tables. This is pre-aggregated data, so when a query comes in, we can simply map this uh, analytics API uh, call into SQL that will fetch the data in these pre-aggregated tables and return the data. So now for some more details. As I said, we're getting data, events, from the clients and what these events look like, they're just JSONs. For instance, this one says an ad was requested or uh, here is an environment in which this ad was served or this ad was actually viewable on screen or there was a click that happened on this ad. For each ad we have to know session ID so it, we know to which uh, lifetime of an ad this belongs to. We know time, we know index so we know if one of these events is missing and we know client ID so we can partition the data by clients. In addition, some of these events have some additional data. For instance, for this last row for click, we know on which screen it happened. And this is our input. Uh, these inputs come from multiple devices in parallel and uh, we have multiple tracking server that just collect this data, store it into files according to date, time and client ID. Uh, for this, we use uh, EC2 and Elastic Load Balancer. So we're on Amazon infrastructure. And once this data is collected, we just store it into S3, which stores these files. And they're partitioned, like I said, by, by date and by client ID. This is input. And now the first Spark job that we run. We have to load this data. And this is what this log analyzer does. We tell it for which time period to load the data. We usually do it in one hour batches, uh, but we can also limit it to, to shorter or longer period or limit it just by client ID. And what this does is it loads the data and it groups it by session IDs. So input is a set of files. For one hour we have like 10,000 files. And then we group those JSONs. So as an output we get Remember, we're working with Spark, so we'll get an RDD of sequences, and each of these sequences will contain events. This is our input data, and one sequence will have events about one ad. Now, from this raw data, we, we clean it up, we handle errors, we group data from multiple events, and as a result, we calculate this uh, session models. So we map this into an RDD 
of these sessions. And the session is nicely cleaned up data about everything that happened in one ad. Uh, and then we store this data. Uh, we serialize these session objects. We add some uh, dimensions like date and IDs. And we store it into a database, into Snowflake. We're using Snowflake, which is kind of uh, a mixture of relational database and NoSQL database. It can work with SQL, but you can also do efficient queries within those JSON objects. Uh, the queries are performed on clusters, so you can, you can make a query about uh, gigabytes of data and it will run for a couple seconds really fast. And the best of all is you can scale this cluster. If you're processing a lot of data, you spawn a big cluster. And once you don't need it, you just shut it down and stop paying for it. Um, okay. And now for the second Spark job that we do, from these sessions, we have to compute uh, the metrics that our clients are interested in. So we have this fact generator that takes a session element and it computes facts. And facts are just maps. For instance, this first one says that uh, one ad happened, it wasn't invalid, it was loaded, it happened on this date and for this ad ID. The, the second line says that for this ad, we had uh, the screen was shown two times, it had one interaction, and the name of the screen was default. So these are the facts. And uh, we have to store this data about the facts, but we can store it in one single table. We store it in multiple tables. This is why we use a uh, cube filler that takes these facts. So we've mapped this into RDD of facts. And these facts, as we've seen, are just maps. This is an example. And we summarize all those facts into, for instance, this table. We see here the data is about two clients. So we have two rows. And we sum 0 plus 1 plus 1, the, the purple ones. This gives us 2 for the number of invalid ads. And 1 plus 0, the blue ones, add up to 1. And we have uh, like 40 such tables uh, in which we have this pre-aggregated data. And uh, we used to store it into a MySQL database. These tables lived in MySQL database, but it became too slow for us. For instance, if we added a new matrix, this means adding a new column to these tables. It, for the upgrade, it took 10 hours and more, which came very big problem for deployment. So instead of this, we're using the Snowflake database now, which is uh, row-based. So for instance, adding a new row happens almost instantly. And uh, now for the last part, uh, how we serve this analytics. For example, let's say we got this query. Give me some metrics broken down by some dimensions and some filters. How we get the result back. Uh, for instance, we can get it from these two pre-aggregated tables. Uh, from the first table, we can get the number of, uh, what is this, the number of interactions. So we select all the dimensions and this metric from the first table. And then we have to do group by and sum. So we get one number for each of those two dates. So this is the result. We do the same thing in the second table and get the number of email clicks. We just join this data, fix these null values, and this is the result. And as a result, our clients have a feeling that when they issue a quarterly report for, a report for three months, this will be a report about 100 terabytes of data. But actually, we have pre-aggregated data, so we can answer these queries in milliseconds. Um, so just to briefly recap this analytics pipeline, we collect these raw events that are JSONs stored on Amazon S3. And the first part job, what it does is it groups these events by session IDs, and it, it computes uh, the, these session objects. Basically, what it does, it cleans the data. In S3, we have unclean data, raw data. Then in Snowflake, we get nicely cleaned up data. Uh, before, we kept this data only in memory. And once the process was finished, once the cubes, these tables with aggregated data were filled, we forgot about it. But we found out that this is very useful information. And processing of this takes a lot of time. So now we are saving it. 
And then the second step, we take this cleaned up data, compute the facts, aggregate them, and store them in these pre-aggregated uh, tables so we can answer the API queries very fast. And we're doing this just simply by translating these API calls into SQL. So this is what I, I had to say. I hope I showed you an example how to use Spark and why to use Scala. In summary, I can say that Scala is good because uh, it forces you to program in a way that, that is easy to parallelize. So Spark can take your code and make it run on multiple computers. So you think you're programming for one computer, but actually uh, this can run on big clusters. So if you get more data, you just spawn a bigger cluster and your program will still work. Uh, so yeah, this is it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Yeah. How convenient do you find uh, this uh, snowflake database? Uh, what is the biggest key feature for you that you are using, uh, particularly this one? Uh, and uh, this one on two steps uh, in your process. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh why we are using Snowflake? Uh, when we are selecting it, we compared it with, uh, with what's a Google solution, uh, BigQuery, and we compared it to, to uh, our uh, solution that we could uh, custom implement it. Uh, the, the biggest advantage was, uh, was that it supports transactions. Uh, but the advantage is this I see as data analysts is that I can query these JSON objects from SQL and that I can spawn a, a big cluster if I need to do a, uh, if I need to do a query about a big amount of data and when I don't need this big cluster I just shut it down and uh, save save the costs uh, and uh, it's basically a managed solution so you you don't have to deal with with hardware and software you, you just use it as a service. You, you subscribe to it, uh, you can push a lot of data to it, you can make queries very efficiently. Uh, so these are the, uh, the advantages that I see. And why we are storing this cleaned up data? Uh, because most of our, most of data that uh, our clients are interested about are stored already in these aggregated cubes tables. But sometimes, for instance, when we're adding a new feature and we don't have analytics for that yet, we have to make, for instance, custom reports. Or when we do debugging, we would always have to go back to S3, load all the events, group them by session. Basically, it will take uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes to, to analyze an hour of data. If we store it into this database, we can make uh, similar queries. Uh, not by writing a Scala program, just by writing an SQL query, and it won't run for half an hour, it will be done in 30 seconds or so. So these are the advantages that I see. When you said those cube tables, are you using there some uh, Mondrian cubes or that kinds of things or not? Uh, what did you say are those? Is, is there like yeah. Modrian cubes? Is that for business intelligence report and stuff? Uh, yeah, yeah. This is uh, not for for business intelligence, but reporting for for our customers. They are interested how many uh, interactions happened on their ads, how many times they were shown, how many times they were not shown, things like that. And yeah, this cube is just uh, a table that has some dimensions. These dimensions are uh, like strings. For instance, the device types, the dates, things like that, uh, client IDs, uh, ad IDs, these are the dimensions. And then we have metrics. These are the values that our clients are inter interested in. This is the number of interactions, the number of ads. Uh, and yeah, we can store all the data into one table. This is why we optimize it and we save it into several tables that make sense. For instance, uh, the data about this store locator how many times you click the search button, how many times you click a uh, phone call in this, uh, is stored in, in one such table. For instance, the, the data about the, the whole ad is stored in another table, which has only the dimensions that make sense for this granularity of data. Did, did I answer your question? Okay. 
Any more questions? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, you're using RDDs. Uh, this currently emphasized is uh, data frames and data sets. Yeah. So what's the reason to stay? Okay, uh, we, we had a workshop with, with Jacek the previous two days, and yeah, he was advocating uh, data set and data frames over RDDs. He says RDDs are too low level, he's calling them obsolete, don't use them. But uh, they first, uh, this was implemented a couple of years ago when there were no data frames. And the second thing is that they, they don't make sense to us because uh, these RDDs. Don't, don't have a nice structure. If you want to translate it into data sets, uh, we can't because this is a list of JSON events and these are different JSONs. Uh, so there's no advantages for us in, in this first stage when we only have to group those JSONs by session ID and then compute one session from that. Then in the, the second phase when we're translating these sessions to, to facts, uh, we have a single data t type, so in this data set you would have only one column, so uh, we stick with, with RTDs. So basically we don't need them, but yeah, uh, Jacek says that you should be using data sets because uh, uh, you get type safety for free. And with RTDs you, you don't have that. Uh, yeah, th this is the, the second point, yeah. Uh, and this relates to, to my first point, uh, first part of the presentation. The more restricted you are, the data set are a bit more restricted than these RTDs, the, the more things compiler can do for you. So if you're using data sets and transformations on these data sets, then yes, Spark can optimize uh, these transformations for you, while well, if you're using RTDs, it can do much. But uh, uh, anyway, in our use case, uh, even Spark couldn't do much, so this is why, for now, we're sticking with RTDs, but I'm not saying that you should be using this. This is just for our use case. We're using the hammer for the nails. If you have screws, use the screwdriver. Any more questions? Okay, so I guess this is it. Thank you.